Hello and welcome to our webinar on the Northern New England resources here at American Ancestors. My name is Ginevra Morse. I oversee all education and online programs at American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be moderating today's event. We are a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. I also want to note that we are uh, broadcasting from our homes with various limitations and distractions. We apologize in advance if there are any interruptions from our end and we thank you for your patience. And even if we do lose, your con uh, lose a connection or anything like that, uh, you will still have access to a full recording on our website. So our presenters today, uh, you'll be hearing from Chief Genealogist David Allen Lambert and Genealogist Melanie McComb. David has been on the American Ancestors staff since 1993 and is an internationally recognized speaker on the topics of genealogy and history. He's published many articles in the New England Historical and Genealogical Register, the New Hampshire Genealogical Record, Rhode Island Roots, The Mayflower Descendant, and American Ancestors Magazine. His uh, genealogical expertise includes New England and Atlantic Canadian records of the 17th through 21st century, military records, DNA research, and Native American and African American genealogical research in New England. Uh, Melanie McComb assists library visitors both on-site and online with their family history research. She's also presented at uh, regional, national, and international genealogical conferences on a variety of topics. Her areas of research interest include Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, Kansas, Prince Edward Island, Quebec, and Ireland. She's also experienced in DNA, uh, genealogical technology and social media, Jewish genealogy, and military records. So in today's session, you'll be directed to several different published online and manuscript materials that can assist you with researching uh, ancestors in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Uh, while there are certainly other records and resources out there for this region on major genealogical websites and local repositories, this webinar will highlight materials that are available on our website, AmericanAncestors.org, or at the American Ancestors Research Center in Boston, Massachusetts. At any point during the presentation, feel free to type your question into the panel to the right of your screen. We'll address those at the end. There is a syllabus for this session that can be purchased from our online bookstore. You'll find a link to uh, that item in your reminder emails, as well as in the follow-up email that I'll be sending everyone after today's broadcast. And uh, as always, we are recording this event, and starting tomorrow, you can freely go back and review any of the content uh, from this presentation on our website for free. So if you missed something on today's first listen, don't worry, you can always go back and review the presentation later. All right, so without further ado, I will turn things over to David. Thank you, Ginevra, and welcome everyone. I wish we all could be in the same room and be talking about this and showing you records firsthand around uh, American Ancestors, our research center in Boston. But I think this is a good alternative, and I'm sure many of you have done some virtual learning since uh, COVID started. So let's get started with uh, some of the sources for Northern New England. My own ancestors uh, lived in all parts of Northern New England, uh, first arriving into Salem in 1629. And of course, as uh, communities got more crowded and land got opened up, they spread out. As you can see, this map of New England in 1755 uh, has the layout of all so it's of the small and early communities uh, around um, both Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. And you probably uh, could see uh, some of the places your own ancestors lived in on this. And maps are great because they're gonna give us that point of starting of uh, where our ancestors come from. And it's also really good to use because you're gonna use maps to try to find out what the neighboring towns are. Keeping in mind things like how towns dotted off from one another. Uh, you may have an old town that separated in two or three towns or created from it. So it's good to know the layout of your area versus just the name. Okay. We're gonna talk about some general guides for uh, 
Northern New England genealogy. And uh, I think some of these might be very familiar to you. Um, one of them is the Genealogist Handbook of New England Research. Uh, the fifth edition is the most uh, current one, but I have some great news to tell you. Uh, coming up not too long from now, we will have the sixth edition edited by Rhonda McClure. Now, and that will be up dated and expanded and have all sorts of new information from the fifth edition that came out a number of years ago. The other thing that's really useful, um, and if you have ancestors that arrived between 1620 and 1640, uh, part of the Great Migration, the Great Migration Directory is a really wonderful tool. Um, it, it basically explains uh, the best sources for those individuals. So it will give you a sort of a one-stop shopping. It'll tell you if there's a date of baptism for a person on there. They will tell you whether or not there's anything that's going to give you a location of where they came from for that baptism uh, or where they resided. It's going to give you the year of arrival or the earliest known date, and it's also going to give you the uh, name of the vessel. Now, the one book that I like to consider um, sort of the uh, the Bible, if you will, of Maine and New Hampshire genealogy was done by Noyce Libyan Davis. And this is a dictionary, if you will, but it has some really detailed information. It's not like a dictionary of surnames, but it is arranged by surname. Uh, and it's sort of like capsule genealogies, if you will. So I have a little sketch here on the right-hand side of a um, – Captain Edward Wilmot, commander of uh, the Charles and the Sarah. And then it goes into talking about his wife, uh, who his spouse was, who her, the children are. And it will often cover multiple generations. And this is a really good getting started, if you will, uh, because it will kind of lay out the basics on most of the early families of both Maine and New Hampshire. Keeping in fact Maine uh, early on, the District of Maine was part of Massachusetts until 200 years ago when it split during the Missouri Compromise of 1820. Now, the nice thing about this is it also has lists. In the, the records itself, it will actually show you the uh, particular petitions or maybe small census uh, breakdowns of a community that are actually in the beginning of the book. So the list numbers are right at the front. So you get a lot of your sources right from it. So you don't have to do a lot of uh, extra searching. Now we're going to start with the, the most popular of all primary sources in genealogy. Of course, it's your vital records. And we're going to cover the three states, uh, starting with Maine. Uh, there are databases on AmericanAncestors.org. And I do want to add quickly to mark on your calendar on October 8th, uh, Donald LeClaire from our web team will be giving uh, a lecture that comes up quite often. Uh, it's what's new at American Ancestors and Don will be giving tips. So anything that you'll find with American Ancestors, uh, with the idea of our library, we have a, a research center with an archives and books and microfilm, but American Ancestors as well as our institution are always changing. So you're going to find new resources. And this, what's new at American Ancestors is something you want to kind of stay tuned to because you're going to find out what's new as well as how to best utilize it. So on American Ancestors, you can look at databases for Maine, such as Maine Marriages and Marriage Intentions, 1849 to 1870. We'll take a little further look at that. Marriage Index of 1892 to 1966 and 1977 to 1996, so well into the end of the 20th century, as well as a death index from 1960 to 1996 on American Ancestors. Just a little bit of a background history for you on Maine vital records since 1820. So after becoming a separate state in 1820, um, basically vital records uh, collecting was really de geared towards the towns. Most towns uh, did collect marriage intentions and a few births. Deaths were really not recorded by towns. And a lot of times when you look at Maine records, like the pre-1892 Maine series, a lot of those death records are actually culled from gravestone inscriptions. So sometimes that's the source that town clerk, the state had wanted them to go out and get copies of these old deaths and return them. Well, they didn't have the records, so they often compromised and found a gravestone. Problem is that sometimes a gravestone isn't for someone who died in that town. 1864 to 1892, civil records were required, but not all the towns compiled, uh, complied and actually sent them in. As I say, about 80 towns returned their records prior to 1892. So you're gonna, you need a lot of combinations of both individual microfilm 
from say the family history library or books or even contacting the towns if they're not in that grouping and at the end my colleague Melanie McComb will talk about some of the town guides and she'll explain further how those are beneficial for you in this type of research. In 1892 the state of Maine required establishment of mandatory compliance of vital record collection so birth marriages and deaths since then are pretty good. So here's an example of on American ancestors of the marriage and marriage intentions. And obviously one of the things with American ancestors is you have any uh, possibility of putting in different types of searches. So you could search just by a last name. Heck, you can even search by your first name if you wanted to, if you're looking for every Zachariah that died or was married between 1849 and 1860. So you could do that. Um, so try this database out on American ancestors. And what it, you will find is not just the text, you're actually gonna find the actual record itself. So these are the scans of the actual marriage certificates for many of these uh, between 1849 and 70. So hopefully you'll have one for your ancestor. Okay, the other thing that we have on American ancestors is we actually have databases that are not just statewide, they're town specific. So it's good when you're using our database uh, search to look for a town in particular you're looking for in your family tree. Um, so you can search on Augusta, see what we have, or you could just put in the word uh, vital and then Maine, and that will search everything that says Maine vital records. And this is how I compiled this list. And as you can see, there's a variety of towns from the 17th century as well right down into the end of the uh, 19th century as well. And this is a pretty good list for the ones that are not included in the 80 towns. And of course, there's lots more. So this is just one way to know that you don't wanna just look at statewide compiled list. You wanna look for town uh, vital records as well. All right, now at NEHGS at our research center, we also have microfilm. So we have individual microfilm for certain towns. So you wanna check our library catalog to check that out. You also wanna look at our vital records prior to 1892. We have that on microfilm. So some people like microfilm, some people like to search online. It's really your preference. We had the film first, but we also have it online. Uh, we have vital records on microfilm from 1892 to 1955. Uh, that includes birth, marriages, and deaths, as well as an index to divorce records from 1892 to 1983, well, almost into the 21st century. So let's take a look at some of these examples. So the individual roles of microfilm for towns, here's an example from Kittery, Maine. And as you can see here, there's some uh, vital records that date back into the 17th century, as well as ones that go into the earlier part of the 18th century. Uh, and you can see the way a lot of these were often set up uh, were individual entries, but some town clerks grouped them together by family as a sort of a family group, if you will, almost like a group sheet. Now, the pre-1892 vital records for Maine, let's take a look at some of the birth records that are being recorded. So the first example here for Sarah Adams, there's not really a lot on here, just tells us that Sarah Adams was born in Andover, Maine on the 23rd of September, 1790. <laughs> not even any parents there. Here's a copy of an old birth record as well. Now this one's from just a little bit later. This is from 1819, but it does say the name of the father and where he lives as well as the mother. So, and the nice thing is uh, that you're getting, in some cases, the actual, where the citation of the record is. Like, so this comes from the town records itself. Uh, in some cases you get volume and page as well. Here's an example of one that goes a little bit later. And this record um, is for someone in Millinocket and you find out the birthplace. It's telling you the person's born in Prince Edward Island and the person worked in a paper mill. So it depends on the record. It really is sort of uh, a dice throw, if you will, as what you might find. Now, post-1892 main vital records, um, the births, the marriages, and deaths are all filmed together. So when you're looking at the microfilm, these are on 16 millimeter microfilm, uh, not 35. And what happens is you almost have to uh, 
know this rule of thumb or it will be confusing. So mind you, it's small, so you need to use a microfilm reader that can zoom in or one of our scanners that will allow you to zoom close, close to it. The microfilm is arranged by surname, then it is arranged by the year. So if you have something that says 1892 to 1908, it'll be all of the uh, birth, marriages, and deaths filmed together, then by year, then alphabetical by the given name of the father. Okay, <laughs> that makes it a little confusing. That's for births. If it's a marriage, it's alphabetical by the given name of the groom. And if it's death, it's alphabetical by the given name of the deceased, obviously. But within that, um, you have to take the microfilm and flip it upside down because on that is the back of the form. They weren't done side by side, <laughs> so you have to flip it around. As an example of this marriage from 1892 for Augustus Anderson. So if I just looked at the first page, yeah, I find some great information. I find his age, I find that he's an occupation, is a jeweler. I find that um, he was born in Sweden, and we'd find his, you know, his bride's name is up here as well. Um, but if I didn't turn it around and do the opposite card, I'd never get all this great information on his parents. The same thing is true with a death record. You want the back of it because on the back of a death record, you're also gonna get the place of burial and the date of burial, and sometimes the name of the cemetery as well. So be conscious if you're looking at main microfilm to look at both sides of the film. Now, again, I had mentioned that we have some divorce indexes. These divorce indexes give you both the name of the bride and the groom. It gives you the date of the marriage, which is sometimes helpful. Sometimes it's not even in Maine. It could have been in Canada or elsewhere. It gives you the date of the divorce, and it gives you the cause for the divorce. And, of course, when you want to do that is contact the Supreme Judicial Court Archives uh, for that particular county to get the actual docket file on the divorce, because this, is, again, it's just the index. New Hampshire, American Ancestors has a database of all birth, deaths, and marriages from 1654 to 1969. You might find that very useful. And you, again, can put in a last name search. Say if you're, you have a guild of one name study search and you're looking for everyone named Lambert, you can put it in and then you can narrow down the years. You can pick if it's a birth, marriage, or a death. So give that a try and um, give you a another peek at some of the record itself. Here's a death record of Jacob Gale in 1884. Looks a lot similar to what you would find from Maine. See, these are copied onto cards uh, from the original records and sent to the state. Same thing is true with New Hampshire. So Jacob's death in 1884 tells you he died of old age, and it does give you the father and mother's names. Now, we also have uh, individual databases for some of the New Hampshire towns as well. Uh, not as many as Maine, but as you can see, some of these go as late as 1940 and uh, as early as 1649. So maybe one of these towns fits into the criteria of your searching. We have microfilm for New Hampshire as well. Now, New Hampshire town records are really one of the most amazing collections. And I'm going to spend a little time talking about that in a moment. Uh, we also have pre-1900 federal records for New Hampshire. Uh, it is alphabetized by the first and third letter of the surname. I like to refer to it as the New Hampshire alphabet. Uh, and then one thing is that not every town is included. So there, there's some limitations to that as well. There's also a bride's index on microfilm. So if you look for a marriage under the surname of the groom, well, let's be all fairness to the bride. There's a cross-reference index for New Hampshire. You can use that as well. Uh, there are post-1900 marriages and deaths, and we have uh, indexes of divorces to 1938 from the earliest. So the New Hampshire town record series, uh, in the upper corner here is a card from my ancestor, Jacob Gale in Alexandria, New Hampshire. Now, what it's telling me here is it's giving me a variety of different page numbers that's available. Uh, it's telling me that there are a uh, variety of volumes here. There are two volumes, one and two. And then I'm given the um, indication that there's an MR and an FR. Now, an MR is a marriage record and an FR is a family record. So I know that if I look at all of these town records, this could be him paying taxes. He could be uh, picked as a uh, selectman of the community but I'm really looking for these MR and FRs because these are where the vital records are. And as you can see here, it's a little faded, but Jacob, uh, Gail, and Lydia Emerson both married um, April 14th, 1803, and gives you who married them, and then it lists all of their children. So this is kind of a great way of having the family 
put together as one unit. And that's how some of the town records, hence vital records were compiled. We also have New Hampshire vital records again on microfilm uh, for the uh, earlier years. Uh, and this is from a marriage in 1880. And in both cases, you're getting both the bride and the groom, and you're also getting the parents and where the parents uh, were born, uh, which is very, very useful for something that late. Uh, you also are going to find that there are going to be some things that are going to com confuse you a little bit. Now, remember, vital records um, prior to 1900 in New Hampshire were not really required. So what happened after 1900? You may have a person like this one, uh, Joseph Grant, who went forward in 1905 and had his birth recorded. It may have been from somebody uh, that was there at the time, maybe an older sibling, or it may have been from a family Bible record or a church baptism document, something to prove his age or her age. You're also going to find that we have pre-1900 New Hampshire vital records. Again, they're alphabetized by the first and third letter of the surname, and they're copied from a variety of other records. So some of them are gravestones, some of them are actual vital records. Uh, I've even some seen some that are copied from uh, diaries. So uh, those private records are occasional in New Hampshire, more so in Massachusetts. And again, just remember not every town is included. So if you look at the microfilm here, the name Loisel to Langley, well, that doesn't make sense, right? Because normally you'd boot Langley before Lazell. Again, it's the first letter, L, and the third letter. So it's alphabetizing by I, and then N, and Langley. So you can kind of see the order here. All right, post-1900 marriages, you get some great information here in these later New Hampshire marriages. Uh, you get the bride and the groom, and that's typical information you get, but how about this information for the parents? You're getting both the father and mother of the bride and the groom their age and where they were born. So if you don't get an age, it will say deceased. So that's a big clue too. So with this marriage that occurred in 1912, you're both getting the birth uh, of the parents. All of the parents are, uh, of the bride and groom are in, born in Austria, but you get their age as well. So nice stuff. All right, post-1900 death records, these are really valuable because they're adding much more information. It's not just a name and a date and cause of death of old age like you saw for Jacob Gale. It's telling you the length of the actual um, time the person was sick. Uh, it's giving you months, years, uh, and days for the uh, cause. And it also gives you some great information who the doctor was, where they died, if they, where they were living, how long they were at a hospital, et cetera. So you can really tell that whole story from the, this death record, this late. Now, again, some vital records, again, are not on microfilm. They're not online, but they may be published. So at NEHGS at our research center, we have over a quarter of a million books, and some of them are local histories on the fifth floor, which include vital records, in some cases, well into the 21st century, as this book for Effingham, New Hampshire, and Freedom, New Hampshire, covers vital records from the town reports published by Heritage Books, covering 1888 to 2001. Multiple generations of these, so you really want to look at any of our books, as well as our microphone, as well as our offerings on American ancestors. Now, on Vermont, on American Ancestors, we have a database of birth, marriage, and deaths covering 1,700 to 2,008, so over 300 years. And again, your search criteria can be as simple as a last name, or you can put in a search. My rule of thumb on any database, maybe American Ancestors or anywhere else you're searching, less is more. So if you've got a full name like Alexander Livingston Johnson, just put Alexander Johnson in. If you get a lot of them, then add the middle initial or the middle names. Uh, a specific year range, be open-minded and you'll find more results and then you can narrow it down. Okay, here's an example from the database. This is a um, birth index card for Mary Jane Mabel, um, born in 1858, giving you that her mother and father are born in Ireland and the father is a laborer. And it also tells you where the child was born at the very bottom. It's telling you it's District 1 of Westford, Vermont. On American Ancestors, we as well have, for both Maine and New Hampshire, 
individual town vital record databases, we also have the following offerings for these towns in Vermont that go from the middle part of the 18th century until the early part of the 20th century. Now, on microfilm in Vermont, we have all the vital records through 1979. Of course, our database is going to echo in some of that for you anyways, uh, but do in fact know that we also have a divorce index from 1861 to 1989 you can use on film. We're going to talk a little bit about census substitutes before we turn it over uh, to Melanie. Uh, and for our census substitutes on American ancestors, we have New Hampshire, miscellaneous censuses and substitutes from 1640 to 1890 as a database. We also have a census for Vassalboro, Maine in 1908, kind of nice between the 1900 and the 1910. We have miscellaneous census and census substitutes for Vermont for the years of 1778 to 1822 and one for 1840, as well as a really early, nearly 20 years before the federal first federal census, the Vermont 1771 uh, sense a substitute for Wyndham in Windsor County, Vermont. So in the Wyndham and Windsor County, Vermont, 1771, it's not just something you're going to plug in a name and just get that text. You're actually going to go ahead and you're going to find that there are images. Hence, the following image is from the Brattleboro Census of 1771, telling you the number of males and females and the names accordingly. In this page, it actually looks like the people signed their name. <laughs> the handwriting is so different on each line. Now we're gonna talk lastly about tax records. This is my half will be divided up. Uh, and we're gonna go into what's available on American ancestors for Maine. We have the 1798 direct tax for Maine in Massachusetts, knowing that Maine came from Massachusetts in 1820. This is a great collection. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, there's the Hollis, New Hampshire tax, I'm sorry, Hollis, Maine tax list from 1862, Norwich Walk, Maine tax list from 1803. And we also have microfilm for various towns and Maine town records that are gonna have tax records included in the records of the town. Now on the Maine direct tax of 1798 Massachusetts, in the early part of the organization of NEHCS, we got word that the customs house actually were burning in their fireplace, the original 1798 direct tax. Somebody got word to us, we rushed over there and we rescued them. Some were lost, but not a lot. So we can do a search on uh, Massachusetts and Maine and the 1798 tax. And the records themselves are not just text, they're in color, they're the actual color pages. And keep in mind, you may have more than one page for an individual. Some of the schedules even tell you how many panes of glass in the windows in your ancestor's house. New Hampshire and Vermont tax records are gonna combine these last two states. On American ancestors, we have Rochester, New Hampshire, 1790 and 1815. And of course, we have microfilm for various New Hampshire and Vermont town records that include tax records within the town records themselves. This last image is from Hinsdale, New Hampshire in 1797. And these are tax records uh, with some great detail. They're paying a town tax, a school tax, a highway tax, and a county tax. Well, thank you very much. And now we're gonna turn it over to my colleague, uh, Melanie McComb, who will start off with uh, Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont probate records. All right, thank you. Okay, and thank you, David, and welcome, everybody. So now that we've talked about taxes, I feel like the next appropriate thing is to talk about probate, which is really right after death. So in this case, we're going to start with Maine. Um, probate records are organized by county. We have microfilm for some of the counties um, at our research center. Now, one key note on Maine, though, is Cumberland County is a little bit of an issue because there was a fire in 1908 at City Hall and the county records were lost. So you need to look for probate substitutes, such as estate sales and the land deeds, or even in newspapers through obituaries or probate notices. One of our databases to look into early Maine probate is our main early wills and deeds, 1640 to 1760. Now, as David mentioned, at this time, Maine was part of Massachusetts, and the only county at this time was York County. So here you can go ahead and put in a name of someone you're looking into, whether in first or last name, 
And then you'll start to see these typed transcriptions. So we even took the legwork out of some of the, the really early writing by giving you a typed transcription of what you're seeing here. So this is a will of Thomas Wells of Wells in, in York County. And he goes on and names his wife, uh, his children, including a married daughter, a Lydia Clark, which can give you a good clue if you're trying to look out more for some of the descendants. Other types of wills you'll, you'll see in our research center come off our microfilm. So in this case, this is a record book copy for Samuel Sparks' will in Bodenham, Maine of 1854. And again, it's going to you know, go ahead and list all of the different descendants um, and who he's leaving part of his estate to. But just keep in mind, this is the copy that the clerk has written into the ledgers. New Hampshire, very similar. It's organized by county, and we have a number of different reels of microfilm available by arranged by county. And another nice thing we have is on microfiche, we have the provincial probate file papers pre-1771. And these are and and in this picture here, you'll see a small selection of the New Hampshire provincial and state papers. There are 40 volumes in total. So when you're looking at early probate, you also can refer to the books we have in our library. To give you an example of what something from the New Hampshire state papers looks like, we see here uh, the will of Godfrey Dearborn. And he's, and he's living in New Hampshire at this time. And again, he goes on, he names his wife, his children, and even names his grandchildren. So we always wanna make sure when we're looking at probate that we're looking at all possible living heirs that could be, um, could be named here. And in this case, it's a typed copy, so it's very easy to, to read here. Now I mentioned that provincial uh, probate files there is an index available on microfilm for the provincial probate papers. So in this case here, in this index card, we see one that for William Pittman, his estate, that there is an inventory as well as a will. And in, in the will of uh, reference here, we see the volume and page number, which helps, oops, um, which, which, which shows uh, the information on how you can find a copy of the will. There also is the original uh, docket number, which helps show that this is the number that you'd be looking for to find, uh, to find the actual state file that corresponds to it. So in the next page here, we see the example of the will, and this is on microfiche now. Um, so we see that 225 number up here. Uh, which shows that corresponds to his pro his docket number, and then we see the original will that has been um, filmed on fiche. Now, if you're looking for anything post 1771, um, instead of getting seeing the loose file of papers that we saw in the previous example, you're going to see the record book copies on microfilm. So this is an example of the will of Thomas Wheelock Jr. of Swansea, New Hampshire, in 1831 from our collection. Now, Vermont gets a little bit complicated when it comes to probate um, because instead of going solely at the county level, it's actually organized by probate district and we have microfilm available for the different probate records. In order to help understand how Vermont probate is arranged, it, like I said, it gets a little complicated. So the Southernmost counties of Bennington, Rutland, Wyndham, and Windsor, so the ones you see in the white in the middle, um, they have two probate districts. So depending on where your family's land is, could you know could differentiate which probate district they fall into. Um, now for the two on in the green on here, Orange County had two until 1994, and Addison had two probate districts until 1962. So now it's originally two, so now one. And the ones on the yellow are the more contemporary counties. So in this case, it's more of a one-to-one -one relationship. So in this case, you're looking for Franklin County uh, uh, probate, you go to Franklin County, very simple. Okay, so now we're going to turn our attention to land deeds because in addition to finding, uh, to finding wills, we want to look at the actual property that our ancestors lived on. So very similar to what we see with probate in Maine, it's organized by county. 
and we have in our research center on microfilm uh, land deeds for Penobscot and York counties. You know, and you always want to make sure you're aware of these boundaries because especially depending on what location you're talking about, you could be in a whole other state. In New Hampshire, we have uh, we have those provincial and state papers that we talked about, and this was really taking place during what was known as the Masonian Proprietary Period. This was the time period from 1629 to 1641 where the province of New Hampshire was granted to the proprietorship of Captain John Mason. And Mason, his heirs, and those who purchased the patent assigned many of the town grants uh, that we see today. You also can find a lot of the other original town charters in these provincial and state papers. And we also have provincial deeds for Rockingham County to 1771. Here's an example of a grantor grantee index that you'll see in the provincial deed and probate index. So the one we saw earlier for probate pre-1771 also has deeds in there as well. So in this case, we see that there is a land sale taking place between a Beatrix Abernathy and a Samuel Rankins for property in Londonderry. Now, something to note here is that this from is not really clear if it's being underlined or crossed out. So we need to make sure we go to the, to the volume and page number to make sure that we're seeing that, uh, we can see a copy of the original deed to see how the land transaction is taking place. This is an example of um, a Cheshire County deed that is off our microfilm. Um, and this was Jonathan Chase of Cornish, um, who is paid by Richard Carlton um, of Tallinn of Hartford, Connecticut, who is selling property. You know, and this we go on, they go on to the terms of how much money was paid, a description of the property. And then further, you see the list of the different uh, witnesses at the very bottom here, as well as a facsimile of his signature, because again, it's the record book copy. For Vermont, there's a quite a few places you can look, especially looking at pre-revolution. So, um, so you're looking at early New Hampshire land grants or in New York. So you have to look at the boundaries to see where exactly your family lived to determine if they're gonna be found in the New Hampshire papers or in the New York papers. There's also a great book by Jay Mack Holbrook of the Vermont Land Grantees, where he goes over the first 15,000 land grants by New Hampshire, 58% of which are in present day Vermont. The rest became Vermont land charters. Uh, this book goes over the land grant townships and even has maps of where th of the localities where they were, and even includes an alphabetical list of the persons who received the grants and shows their name, year, and the source of that information. Since 1777, we're going to find land records are going to be created and maintained at the town level. There are some exceptions. Um, some of the earlier records are issued at the county level, particularly for Rutland and Orange County. Here's an example of a deed in Orange County, Vermont in 1861 uh, between a Charles W. Holbrook and a Philander Moore. And again, in this case, since it's a little bit less of a form, he actually goes on and describes the terms and goes on to describe more of the property, even down to the lot number. So a lot of, a lot of great detail in here. And this is off our microfilm. Okay. Now, before you, um, a, a, key, a key idea of doing New England research is also looking at the study projects, is to see what other genealogists and historians have put together on different families of a particular region. So the most popular one we know about is uh, the Great Migration, which David talked about earlier, but the Great Migration Directory, written by Robert Charles Anderson. In addition, he's also written several sketches um, on these families, and these sketches go through 1635. So 1636 to 1640 has not been completed yet. Um, just keep that in mind on our website. And where, uh, where Robert Charles Anderson leaves off, Alicia Crane Williams picks up with early New England families, 1641 to 1700. And we're gonna show some examples in a moment. So when you wanna go ahead and do a search, you can put in a name. And as David mentioned, you can do a first or last name search 
here to see what, what pulls up. And you can even make it the, the main immigrant that's being focused on, or even a family member. You could search why there's somebody else maybe that was um, married or a father or, or, or another uh, cousin that should, that should show up in their sketch. That's another way to look for more people. So in this case, we have the sketch of Edward Hilton. And the sketches start off with uh, giving some key information on if we know about their origins. So has it been traced where they were from in England uh, when they came over? So in this case, he was from London. He migrated in 1628. He first resided in Dover, New Hampshire, and then removed to Exeter by 1639. And he even went back and forth to England. So that's interesting to know if you were trying to track him. It goes on to talk about his occupation, his education, the property he had, and then goes on and talks about his family. So who he married, what children he had, et cetera. Early New England families is, is set up very similar. So you can go ahead and put in a search in the name fields here or down in the family members. And there's even like a little checkbox to note if you're looking for the featured name only. So if you're looking for that key sketch or if you're just want to look for a mention of them. So this is a case of Samuel Dudley's family, and we see here that he's listed with uh, two different wives and their children, and the information is footnoted here, versus in Great Migration, it was actually bracketed right in the text. Another study project that, that you may not be familiar with is specific to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, is Portsmouth Families. We actually have these films from the New Hampshire Historical Society. There's three volumes. And these are family records. So when we say they're family records, we're going to look at a grouping of family here. So here's George Pierce, and it notes all the different, um, you know, information on their ch on their children, and talks more about where they went to. So it's a nice way to see in, a, in an index card format of um, enough information about a family to pursue that lead further. So you can find this on microfilm in our library. Another study project is early Vermont settlers. And it's broken up into two different databases. The first one is the early Vermont settlers index cards. This started out as a thesis project by Donald Allen Smith, who actually created these index cards. So you can go ahead and put your name in here to find out more information. And then we'll show you an example of what one of these cards looks like. So here's one for Sergeant Benjamin Larrabee of Rockingham, and it notes his date of death, his religious affiliation, his political affiliations, that he took the oath of allegiance in 1777. Um, it noted that he was in, in the Vermont militia and even notes his Revolutionary War service. So if you're looking for that DARSAR link, these can be a, a goldmine of information to help you find more. Now, in addition to that index cards, which, by the way, I should mention were indexed by Scott Andrew Bartley, who actually is heading up the project, um, Bartley has actually gone on to write sketches of the heads of household mentioned in these index cards. So again, you could do a search to see if the sketch has already been written up, either by the first name, last name here, as well as down here uh, during family members. And if you're looking for that main name, you check off feature name only. So here's an example for John Layton of Heartland, and it goes on and talks about his possible parentage and lineage, where he was baptized and when, who he married, talks about his children, and even goes on about some of the property he had. So it looks like he was one of the patentees of a New York patent for Hertford, and even goes on to talk about uh, the offices he served in. So a lot of good information in there. Now, a great find that we want to look at is the many manuscripts. There's many published items, but there's also all the unpublished pieces of information that we have in our library. So I'm going to show a couple of examples of things from each state. This is a Buxton, Maine record book by John Eldridge Frost, in which he, he actually went through several different cemeteries and uh, transcribed the different headstone inscriptions. So here we see for Old Groveville Cemetery, the burial place for the Second Free Will Baptist Church, which is now demolished, so he adds that note in, at Spruce Swamp. And then goes on and talks about the Waterman family. So Captain David Waterman, and he talks, and he talks about his wife, Rhoda, 
and children marry. There was even an infant here with those dates. So you, again, you're seeing that family format because all of the gravestones are nearby. We also have some really interesting collections like the Henry Augustus Pierce papers. Now, the, these largely contain the records of the 20 Associates Land Company, which controlled 100,000 acres in Maine from 1794 to 1832. Now, they had to wait until after the French and Indian War, Indian War to start settlement, and Camden was the first settlement. This map actually depicts the different lot numbers, the numbers of acres, and even in some cases, you even see some names in here of, where, um, of how the, the land was divided up. And we can't forget about our old friend, John Farmer. He's the father of American systematic genealogy. Before he, before he was really being prolific, uh, genealogy was very much about uh, establishing yourself in British society, but he really wanted to celebrate being an American and really celebrate our American history. His pa we actually have his papers in our collection, and these include correspondence with such folks such as uh, Joshua Coffin, Lemuel Shattuck, and even include such pieces as this uh, records of death and ages in Concord that actually covers from about 1792 to 1799. Now, sadly, the bobblehead is not included. It's at the New Hampshire Historical Society. But on this record of deaths in Concord, you get some information on the different individuals here. So here you have a, a Sarah Thompson, the wife, the wife of Benjamin Thompson, and notes that he had actually left the country at the time of the revolution. So you can even see maybe a mention of a loyalist in here. You also see some causes of death, where here was a case of a Benjamin Davies who um, had committed suicide, or an individual down below that had died of smallpox. So he added a lot of different information that was really helpful. John Elliott Bowman uh, has done a number of different um, work, pieces of work, including cemetery records and other pieces that you'll find in your handout, including this uh, cemetery transcription for St. Albans, uh, Vermont, in which, again, very similar to the Buxton, Maine, where he gone and, and described each of the different individuals. So we have Illaby Sherman, uh, wife of Captain D. Seeley, and, when, and when, uh, when she had died and how old she was. And in some cases, they even noted like some inscriptions, such as here was uh, Jane, a wife of Alpheus, and the description of our mother. So probably her parents, had, uh, her, rather, her children had erected um, a headstone to her. We are starting to add a lot of these different cemetery transcriptions into this online database on American ancestors, so for North America. And what's great about this is that you can actually use the volume dropdown to sort by, uh, by the state initials, the county, and the town, just to see what's available. I definitely recommend a checkout to see what's already been done, because in some case, someone may have already went to that cemetery you've been meaning to go to. This is an example here from the from the Gage Cemetery in Ferrisburg, Vermont. In this case here, we have it for the Tupper family. And you note that there's a, a number here, the 104 monument. So this is a marker for the, that grave site. And it notes different directions here. So on the west side of the monument, we have A. Tupper, October 15th, 1886. And there's even a little notation that noted that his, that his name was Absalom, son of Ira, that was added here. And on the south side of the monument, we have Ira Tupper. So this very, very well might have been an obelisk or some other gravestone where you need to check each of the different sides because an entire family might be captured on it. We've recently updated our digital library and archives. I'm just going to show a few brief examples. Uh, Sally Benny is going to do a more detailed dive on, in November um, on our digital library and archives. Let's, sh let's show a quick brief look at it. So if you go to digital.americanancestors.org, you can go ahead and search into it. We have compiled materials from three repositories, which include um, our library, our research library at NEHGS, the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center, um, and the R. Stanton Stavery Special Collections, 
and again, the research library. So three different main pieces um, of information where you could see digitized books, uh, manuscripts, uh, maps, photographs, all kinds of things. So this is an example of one of our local history books out of Andover, Maine. And if we go to the next page, we'll see a, a little bit blown up, but it's looking at marriages of 1804 to 1838. And what happened was that the records were actually um, typed up from the original which were arranged chronologically, and now they're arranged alphabetically by surname. So it's a lot easier to find your person. So at the very top here, we see a Joseph S. Carlton Jr. of Berlin, um, who had published An Intent of Marriage, November 24th, 1834, to Marianne Sweat of Letter B. You can also find all kinds of things like military commissions in here. This was a really interesting one. This is a handwritten document signed by Governor Wentworth, who was the governor and commander in chief of the province of New Hampshire. He authorized Josiah Willard and Samuel Ashley to administer oaths to officers in the 5th Regiment of the Foot in New Hampshire. So you can actually see a scanned manuscript that would be in our collection right here at home. A few online guides are will be very helpful for you to continue to do your research. We're going to look at uh, two, two main items here. First is going to be the town guides. So when you go up to the top search toolbar and you go down to articles, guides, and study projects, you'll go under New England and New York town guides. And then from there, you're going to see different town guides that have already been created through New England, and we also have New York as well. And from here, you can then select the appropriate state you're looking at. So we're going to highlight a little bit on Maine here. So on Maine, we have the name of the town arranged alphabetically. We have the year of incorporation. We have the county. And we have some nuances specific to each state. So for Maine, David talked about the pre-1892 uh, microfilm collection. So if they are included in that collection, you will see it marked as yes in this column here, knowing that they, they would be included. If it's no, then you're going to have to look at other sources for those town records and probably look on family search. You're also going to see other names for the names of town, if there have been any changes um, um, to the boundaries at all, and also any related databases. So we're, if we scroll down to the letter F, we actually see a number of different towns here where for Farmingdale here, we have Farmingdale in Kennebec County, and we have a vital record database that you can go and click right into to access on American ancestors, um, if you're a member here. So in this case, it covers 1760 to 1892. So it's a little bit of a time saver here. Um, another great place to find online resources is our subject guides. We are always looking for new ways to give you more content at home if, um, to find more resources. And you can get this um, from the Learn tab here, and you can learn all about different types of things, such as getting organized, genealogical software, and we even cover specific locations, such as the recently published subject guide for Maine that was done by genealogist Tricia Mitchell. And it's a very comprehensive and detailed guide that talks about the resources at our library as well as elsewhere. So if we have identified there's certain databases of family search or ancestry or other places you should access, we're gonna point those out to you. So it really is a nice one-stop shop if you want to learn all you can about Maine in this case. And we're gonna keep adding more as we go. So I hope this has given you a lot of good information on how you can dig more into northern New England and learn more. Um, as you can see, we've covered a lot of the uh, top record sets. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. Um, I'm sure there'll be others you'll, you'll come across, though. Um, so I hope that this is you know, giving you some good ideas and to help you with your brick walls. And now I'll turn it over to Ginevra for Q&A. Well, thank you, Melanie and David, for your great overview and presentation on some of the resources that we have at American Ancestors. Um, so let's get to your questions. If you have anything that you'd like to ask, go ahead, type it into the questions panel. Um, we'll try to get to as many as we can in the time provided, but know if we don't get to your question, there are other ways that you can reach us. So first up, and David, I think this is maybe a question for you. Um, Margaret says, uh, you know, I have an ancestor born in Wales, Androscoggin uh, County, Maine in 1794. Should I be looking for records under Massachusetts for that time period? So can you kind of 
talk a little bit about um, when you should be looking at records in Massachusetts versus Maine for those earlier period for that earlier period. Sure. Well, Margaret, the, um, the the main thing to keep in mind is that the towns still have their records. Uh, once uh, Maine became its own state, there wasn't anything they had to pull back from Massachusetts. We didn't have civil registration back then. So uh, you're dealing with just town records, county records, the counties that are in Maine. Uh, there are some counties that have doddered out and split. Um, so it may not be the original county in the 18th century as a uh, uh, Melanie had talked about in probate, all Maine was York until 1760. Um, so yeah, you're really in good shape in Maine. I mean, it's a, it can be a combination of things. I mean, obviously vital records in church, you're gonna find on the town level. Um, hopefully the town has recorded his birth. Uh, there may be part of the, um, the microfilm that's already been done the, uh, by Family Search that we have at American Ancestors, or you might find it uh, digitized online. Um, the other thing is county records like probates and deeds. These are type of things that you're going to still find in the counties that are in Maine. Um, we have a good collection of them uh, at NEHGS. Um, but if you can't get there also, again, you can see what we have online. Um, and then the only thing that you're going to find that is going to be probably something worthwhile looking at. And again, he's got a small window because it's only about 26 years. There is a collection at the Mass State Archives called the Massachusetts State Archives Collection. Uh, it's 320 plus rolls of microfilm. Uh, Family Search is indexed, um, sorry, digitized this collection. However, the index isn't completely done. And this is to petitions and muster rolls and things like that. So military records, for instance, you'll find back in Massachusetts and things like that nature. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Uh and you know some of the records that we showed are on microfilm at the library uh have some all none of those microfilmed records have they been digitized and available somewhere melanie you want to take this or do you want me to grab it sure i can take it so i think okay. it, dep it depends on what particular collection largely a lot of the town records uh you know land and probate most of those have been microfilmed. It's more a matter of, is it already available and ready for you to look at at home? So a lot of cases, the Family History Library has already um, done the work and it's just a matter of, we're waiting for the, the reel to be fully digitized on their end though. So it, it does depend. There are gonna be some of those collections, like we saw like with the pre-1771, uh, the fiche, where those you may not necessarily find um, elsewhere may not be as common. So unless you're going to like the um, like the New Hampshire State Archives or some other collection where they might have a similar copy. I don't know if David, you want to add anything on? Yeah, I just want to add with Family Search. I mean, there's tremendous the amount of things they've digitized. Again, you know, when we were buying films 25, 30 years ago at NEHS, there were no online versions, so we spent you know thousands of dollars buying films. Um, one thing you have to keep in mind, though, um, is that some of the Family Search databases are affiliate access only. So that means you have to be at a Family Search affiliate library. Uh, you can't do it from your regular login. So if you ever see that icon with a camera and a key above it, that is a perfect indication that you need to be at a place like NEHGS or, or another Family Search affiliate library near you to actually look at those digital collections. Thank you both. Uh, Kathleen has a question. Um, she says, you know, I'm looking for someone born around 1785 in Maine, but not sure where. Should I look at each town's vital records? Um, she says, I've tried some church records, but no luck. So if you don't know exactly where an ancestor was born, married, died, um, especially in kind of, uh, I'd say 17th and 18th century mm -hmm. New England, what, what are some strategies? How would you kind of go about finding them in various records? Well, the first thing I would really do is I would try to see where that surname is populated. And so obviously looking at the 1790 uh, census, uh, and then you can also look at the 1798 direct tax, um, that might help you even more, or the 1800. Um, at least, you know, if it's not Smith or Jones, you may be able to see where, what county that name is populated most in. Uh, and then what you have to do is you have to use the, like our town guide that uh, Melanie talked about and sort of make a checklist. You uh, may have an idea of maybe where the family uh, first appears, maybe look at that county first, especially if they stayed in Maine. Um, but that'd be one approach. The other thing is once you have the surname, 
Uh, if you don't find a vital record, maybe you start looking at probate records and see if the last will and testament mentions I leave to my son or daughter um, that may not have a birth record existing or a church record. Right, and another approach I would say to take if you're thinking of there's a migration that happened is start off with the last person that you know where they are, and I would say try to trace back their property, because if you can see when they first purchased property, like let's say they moved out of Maine to Massachusetts or somewhere else, if you start from there, you can then start to see where the person was coming from at the time of sale, and then if you keep going back, that will help you go back further to see where they might have originally been. Thank you. Uh, we have a few questions about um, some of the vital record cards that you showed examples of. Um, you know, so it's it's not the original vital record. It's kind of a maybe a derivative card uh, copy uh, that takes mm -hmm. and pulls out some of the key information. You know, Laurie asks, how reliable are those databases that are kind of those cards? Should you seek out the original? Are they derivative? Can you kind of talk about what those cards are and how best to use them? Sure. Um, the cards really are at the will and pleasure of the town clerk that had to send the copy back to the state. May it be New Hampshire, Vermont, or Maine. Um, in every case, it's considered a primary source. However, the first generation of that primary source, if I could say it that way, would be to look for the original records. So as FamilySearch has digitized things, has NEHGS has put things online, you can more easily find that record. And of course, you could always send a note to the town clerk and say, could you send me a scan of the original page this came from? You definitely don't want to stop with transcribed copies from the 19th and 20th century, because again, there could be a mistake. Uh, you know how old handwriting is. Somebody may have read a name like Poor as pool and you're all of a sudden you're not looking for your ancestor you're looking and you pass over it in the index when you're searching so yeah look for the originals always well i know that there are a lot of questions that we didn't get to um but uh someone very um fortuitously asked about the chat service. So I wonder if either David or Melanie, you could talk about the chat service, how that works. And um, if people do have additional questions or they're curious about, you know, what records to look for or kind of a basic reference question, um, how to utilize that, that chat feature that we have. Sure, I can talk about that. So, so currently today we have a chat service um, from Tuesday to Saturday from 3 to 4 p.m. And we are looking at ways to expand that where you can ask a, a one of one of the genealogists like myself and David, um, you know, if you have like one of those quick questions. So maybe you're looking for advice on, you know, what kind of record set you should look at for a particular area. Um, or maybe you see a reference in a book that you just can't decipher. Those are good ones that you can send over to us um, as a quick reference. And it's, you know, it's a free chat that you can do through our website. Um, if you go to AmericanAncestors.org forward slash chat, um, that'll be the page and it'll be open three to four. If it's something more complex, then we might recommend more of a consultation. So we can actually, uh, that would be a paid service where we could walk you through how you could do the research yourself, but pointing you to more specific resources and really looking at the research you've already done. And then of course, there's always research services if you want to hire us to do more research on your behalf. All right. Well, thank you again, both David and Melanie. Thank you, everyone, for your fantastic questions. I um, I highly recommend checking out the chat service, uh, as well as considering booking a consultation with one of our genealogists. Both Melanie and David give fantastic one-on-one -on -one consultations. You could also hire our research services team to do research on your behalf. Um, you can learn more about those services by contacting the email addresses that you see on your screen, and I'll also include that in my email follow-up uh, later today. So thank you again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. Uh, this free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American ancestors to keep these programs free and to create more programs uh, for you and for others.
course. And if you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org slash education. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.